Virginia's Appalachia, rich in culture and tradition, and largely misunderstood by outsiders. The region is a bridge from the past to the present. This series will explore local legend and lore mixed with the science and skill you'll only find in Virginia's Appalachia. Today, we're taking you to Franklin County, the moonshine capital of the world. People didn't look up to us, you know, as those bunch of moonshiners, except when it came holiday time. Every holiday, they'd always come around wanting some brandy from us. The rest of the year, they'd be customers, you know, those, those low-life moonshiners. And to watch it evolve the way it has over the past five or ten years has just amazed me. You know, you take these Appalachian Mountains and all, these Blue Ridge Mountains, the ice cold water running out of them. I mean, we got the ideal place to make moonshine. I like to call this area the Goldilocks Zone. You know, it's, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's not too wet, it's not too dry. The climate and all is just perfect to make moonshine. You know, ice cold water. All these mountains that you can hide in. And centrally located. Now, you gotta keep that in mind too. You know, we're right here in Virginia, so Philadelphia, New York, North Carolina, Atlanta, you know, Ohio, Chicago, well, you're right in the middle of it all. As far as distribution is, we were set. And for years, I'm like, ah, oh, damn, making all these sales with this liquor, and then, it, you know, it hit me. Yeah, we are. We're right here in the middle of it all. When we're talking about moonshine, that's a term that a lot of people outside the region use. Around here, they refer to it as white liquor. And originally in the 18th century, it was a farm product. Um, a lot of the inventories of the early settlers had a still in their uh, equipment. And in the fall of the year, when apples or peaches or whatever was um, being harvested, they would make liquor and sell it. And so it's always been made in this area from the 18th century to the present day. And uh, the thing I think that most people don't think about, they think about someone making liquor and it's made for the community right around them. But in this community, it's been a way of business, a way of life, a way to support yourself. And whole families were involved in it. And um, it's just part of the customs and the culture of this region. The history of moonshine in this region, um, we're just really well known for it. And it's because it was really um, an industry. It wasn't just a business, it was industrial in volume. And I think people just don't understand the magnitude of what was being produced here, especially in the western part of Franklin County. And that's why we became to be known as you know, the moonshine capital of the world. People have a misconception that, you know, the people, um, you know, are hillbillies, that they're lazy, and it's the complete opposite. Um, there's a lot of ingenuity involved in, in making moonshine because you're trying to make it in circumstances that are very hard. Um, you have to be very creative. And so um, in many ways, it's very sophisticated what they do. And um, there's no way that you would want a product that's bad because you want to have returning customers. So you want to make your products really well. And the folks obviously did in Franklin County. And that's why moonshining, you know, we're, we're known for that. And it's part of our heritage. And we embrace that heritage and it's based on facts. I mean, there's, you know, there are books written about it and it's, you know, the, the records from, you know, the train companies and everything about how, you know, the shipments of sugar and, all the products coming through here, it's, you know, it's, it's legitimate. So we just stated that that's a way of, you know, making, making a living and making a very good living for some of those folks at the very top. Well, it started um, with the people that settled the area. And they came out of Ireland, they came out of Scotland, England, they came out of Germany, and they had a knowledge that they brought with them. And so it was just part of their culture, their heritage that they brought with them. And it was established here. It was established in most of the uh, colonies or the states early on in the East Coast. It was just something that was part of everyday life and farming. So the traditions were already within the families. And that's how it came and it just continued here. Other areas it did not continue, but in this area it continued. 
during the uh, prohibition, it just boomed in this county. That was probably the heyday. And uh, from looking at railroad records to the amount of sugar that was sent in by, by box car loads here and unloaded, the amount of containers that were shipped in here, uh, it was a real heyday for making it. And after that, uh, when prohibition was over, it was legal and legal to buy it, but there still was a market for this other alcohol. It was cheaper. And so it was sold in a lot of different places and it continued, and it continues on to this day. Now we have several legal distilleries in this county. Some of them are really tied to families that had a tie going back generations into making whiskey. And it's sort of been a, a thing of pride. There was a pride in what you made. People have talked about whiskey that would make people go blind or uh, things like that. You didn't sell whiskey to someone that would not come back as a repeat customer. And if you were selling someone 60 or 80 cases of whiskey, you wouldn't get paid. So this, this thing of going blind and selling bad whiskey just wasn't taking place because it was a business. And that's what people have to realize. You know, if you take a moonshine, you take a stack of metal and a stack of lumber and set it out here on the ground, how many people can take that metal and that lumber and cut it and nail together submarine steels, turnip type steels, steamers that we used to run from nothing. I mean from nothing. Most people these days have to run out and buy it, get online and try to buy the equipment. We build everything that we've ever used. And with that said, then you gotta get out and you, you know, to set up a steel site and hopefully make some money, you gotta find it a place to put it. In the summertime, you got all the leaves out, so you can go under these big old white oaks and red oaks, and everything's fine. But then when wintertime comes and leaves fall, you got to find a pine patch. And that's what my dad always did. You know, we had, he knew everybody in the county, and everybody in the county knew him. So we had no problem finding sites. We'd give a, guy, a landowner maybe 100 bucks a week to come through his land. He didn't care. A little drink of good liquor. And then you got to have the water. You got to have enough water to supply that cooling system. Not only do you have to fill these subs up, but uh, when you go to run that liquor, you gotta have a stream of water that runs all day long. You can't stop in the middle of it. You gotta condense all that steam. You gotta condense it down to your, to your alcohol, and you're talking about an all day process from daylight to dark, days and days in a row. So you got to make sure you got plenty of water. You got to make sure you got plenty of coverage. You got to be able to get in and out of a steel site. You know, summertime, you can take a regular car, a regular pickup truck, and drive right on in because there's no yeah. snow and ice and all that stuff. Come winter time, all that went out the window. You had to have four wheel drives, Jeeps. You had to have chains. I mean, you had to have an array of vehicles just to get into a site because you've got to, you're going far, far back in the woods. You're not working on the side of the road anywhere. You're working way back in the woods. Setting up a steel site is a whole lot more to it than most people think. You gotta find some land, you gotta have plenty of water, you gotta have plenty of coverage. First thing we do, is, of course, is find a piece of land with a nice sized creek on it and the landowner that's willing to take a few dollars to let us come in. So once all that's taken care of, you come in, you start digging in your flues and uh, you set your steel. The center blocks has to be full of dirt. You put about that much sand or dirt on top of it for the, to level up the steel. Too far. We're gonna mash it in the barrel, not yeah. the steel. Right, exactly. All right. You think about the climate here. I mean, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's not too wet, it's not too dry. I mean, it's perfect. It's perfect for our grain. It's perfect for the, the, the water that we need. And that's why our liquor is so good. That's why our liquor is so good, just because of these springs. You can see rolling down these rocks here. And if you don't have good water, you must hang it up. You can't, we've, we've worked out of, off of rivers, and we've worked off of ponds. 
Oh, you can so you can taste it once the liquor comes out. It, no, not that. It just don't produce as much liquor. Oh. Yeah. When you turn, when you come off of these springs like this, come straight as mountains, you make a whole lot more liquor, and that's what it's all about. Good liquor, and 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 uh, good turnout. Good turnout, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. Now you now you learn. Then you put your water in there, you take your pump running, put your water in the steel, get it boiling, because we're here now to do a mash. We're mashing in, gonna have a certain grains. We're not worried about a worm, we're not worried about a thumper, we're not worried about any of that right now. Right now, all we wanna do is get this baby mashed in. Get everything mashed in, boil the water, cook in our grains, get everything mashed in, cover it over. Now we've got four or five days for this mash to work off. We're gonna let this cook for an hour, and then we'll do what we call sweetening it. We bring some malted, we got that malted barley. It's gonna be just like cornbread when you look in there. It's gonna be thick. Once that malted barley hits it, those enzymes in it, it's gonna break it up real thin. And then, then the whole trick is we're gonna have to beat the heat out of it. It's a little trick to that. You, you, you beat that heat out, and when you're able to stick your hand down in there and move it around without jerking it out, that's what's some weird stuff, man. It, may, it means it's ready for the water. And time you fill the barrel up, the temperature will be exactly what you're looking for. It works right. every time. All right, cool. Crazy stuff, old timers, man. You can't argue with them. Yeah. Don't argue with them. You know, we like using, uh, you know, we use an abundance of rye, malt, malted barley, corn, wheat, and all from the general area, from the farmers. You know, everything comes from this area, grown right here. I and mean, it gives me chills even talking about it, because everything's just grown right here and uh, when you take those pure fresh ingredients and you grind them up and you mash in those steels it's a good feeling it's a great feeling because you know there's nothing in it can harm anybody it's no additives no preservatives and, and we do the same thing with, with our with our peaches growing up in this area um, you know, everyone, I don't care who it was, son, you knew somebody that was involved with it. You just had to, whether it was your family or a friend or whatever. And um, some people were, you know, didn't want to talk about it. And it really wasn't talked about until honestly, you know, the past decade or so because of the distilleries coming about now and it's, oh, you know, the mystique of it. Um, my grandfather in 1935 paid cash for a brand new car, a brand new pickup, a brand new bulldozer and a brand new two-story brick house. That's the amount of money he was making at the time. Um, but there's a lot of people that you know laugh about it and um, you know just don't take it seriously. And I just I've always found it an immense source of pride that people in this area, you know, were so um, you know creative and hardworking that you know look what they did with nothing. And um, you know they they made something of themselves with nothing. So I think it's a it's a wonderful thing to talk about. But a lot of people they think about it in the in the stereotype in that in that way. You think, oh well, we're more than that. Well, of course we are more than that. But look at this. You know, this is really you know our roots. This is who we are. These are our ancestors. Let's be proud of that. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of in my opinion. And now with alcohol being you know it's okay to make it, all these distilleries, that's changed perception. You know, it's just the cool factor now, and oh, that's really neat, but hey, we go way back with it, and this is why we're known for it. Back talking about the moonshine days, my father was a big kingpin moonshiner. I mean, he ran uh, probably one of the biggest moonshine business this country's ever known. And, uh, you know, I grew up around it. I used to take and pump gas for him and he'd go out to steel sites. They used raw gas back then, came in 10 cans, and, and he'd give me a nickel a can to pump the gas. It'd be bunches of cans. Then the next day, those cans would be gone. I'm like, man, he got some kind of operation going on here. And then I remember him sitting around before daylight when I was a kid, and be four or five guys around the kitchen table, and they'd be talking business. Of course, at that time, I really didn't know what the business was, but as I got a little older, he started taking him, and would take a few pints of liquor and have me to hide it out in the woods. So if people would come wanting a pint or two, he would uh, send me out to get the liquor and bring it, bring it back to the house to make the sales. But you know, I watched my father go in. You know, was in and out of prison my whole childhood, my whole entire childhood. You know, visiting him in prison. So I pretty much knew what was going on. 
and it came to a point where, you know, was working, working in the factories and all, there's nothing wrong with that, but I want to do the same thing that my dad did, my uncle, my grandfather and all that. Now I'm starting to get a little taste of all that, you know, knowing what they're doing for a living. So I asked him one day, I said, you know, Dad, I want to, I want to make liquor. You know, I turned 18 years old, and I said, I want to make liquor. I, I, the factory up there is killing me. You know, going in at 5 o'clock, I'm at 6 o'clock in the morning, can't get out at 4 or 5 o'clock at night. That just wasn't for me. So he said, all right, son, I'm going to tell you now. He said, you go in there, you got to remember a couple things. You're going to have diamonds on your fingers, gold around your neck. But the biggest thing is you're going to have shackles on your feet if you stay with it long enough. And he was right. You know, you make that money, everything's great. You got them diamonds and that gold if you want them, but those handcuffs and shackles are definitely on the way. You know, years of making liquor throughout the county, you sort of build a rapport with the agents and all. You got your ATF, which is federal, and you got your ABC, which is state. These guys, I mean, they do their job. Believe you me, they do their job. But you had a certain number of them that wouldn't overdo the job, I guess I'm trying to say. They would come in and raid a steel site, and they would know who you are, but they wouldn't go swear out a warrant for you. I mean, it's amazing when, when, you, when you think about that. Now, a lot of the agents, if they saw you within a half a mile of a steel place, they'd go take out a warrant for you, and then you had to prove that you wasn't at that steel site. You know, and if you don't have any witnesses, you'd be hung. And some, a lot of agents has done that over the years. You know, just arrest you know, whomever they wanted to, really, just because they thought they was there, because they must have been working the steel site because it's on that road. But as time went on, another bunch of agents came around, and they were, I like to think they were much more men because they wanted to catch us. They wanted to jump on our back, slam us into the ground, and put the handcuffs on us like a real man. And a lot of them really hated doing their job, I would say, because they did have so much respect for the moonshiners. But, uh, you know, it was like a cat and mouse game. You know, they was after us trying to put us in jail, and we were trying to get away. I mean, you're talking generations of moonshine in here. Generations. You take, right now, people beg for recipes. You know what? We got the recipes. And we, we kept a close-knit tie on those recipes, too. My father always told me, he said, you don't let those recipes get out. You know, generations are tweaking it. And, and I laugh now, and I tell people, I wasn't taught how to make moonshine. I was told how to make it, you know. All right, son, this is where it's done. Don't change anything. <laughs> Do it exactly the way that we've been doing it. And who might argue with that? Get everything mashed in boiling water, cook in our grains, get everything mashed in, cover it over. Now we've got four or five days for this mash to work off. While that's working off, we bring in our thumper, we bring in our water box, our condenser, all that. We set all that up to make sure everything lines up. We take the cap, bring the cap in, all the piping and tubing that we need to line all that up. Yeah. Once we get all that done, we know we set when that mash works off. It comes under cap. When it works down, it'll be sizzling. And, and you know, you, you listen to it when it quits sizzling and you taste it and it's good and bitter and you know she's ready to run. It's not sweet, all the sugar's done worked out of it. Let's clear it right up. Now you talk about people using hydrama, this is like that, you know what our hydrama is? It tastes pretty bitter. Whoa. Yes, it is bitter. Yeah, Give me sugar left in that. Come in, you bring, and we bring our propane in with us. We bring a, a proof and barrel in with us with a filter. So once you dig these flues in, get everything in, all the equipment in, and the beer's ready to run. We come in that morning, we put our mash over in the steel, we throw the fire to it, we use propane with no regulators on it. We're coming straight off of the propane tank. With a regulator, you don't get enough heat yeah. to heat a steel that size. So we always take the regulators off, which is very dangerous. And um, once we throw that fire to it, you gotta keep it stirred. Constantly you gotta keep it stirred. If you don't keep it stirred, it will burn. Now, a lot of people talk about uh, poison, methanol, and all this stuff. That's one thing about here in Franklin County and the Appalachian Mountains here. 
anybody's got any sense at all to know, and these guys do through these areas, methanol boils off at 148.5 degrees. When it hits that temperature, all the methanol boils off, then the ethanol starts to boil. Once that starts to boil, you cap the baby. So you've got no methanol in your system at all, it's gone. Once you cap that baby, when it starts to boil, the steam comes out, which is ethanol. Now what you want to do is you want to take it where you want it to go. And that's where the cap and all the equipment comes in. Now we want to direct it a certain way. So we put the cap on it, we chain the cap down, and the first place we want to take it is to the thumper or the doubler. And that doubler will have usually has chargings in that doubler to where it'll increase the alcohol after we get it run. It also strips it of impurities. A lot of impurities go through that doubler. The alcohol travels from the steel to the cap, over to the doubler. Now it goes from the doubler over to the coil worm. Now, this coil worm, we call it sitting in a water box. We got the pump running. Cold water's constantly coming into that water box. Your water line, and this is very important, your water line goes in the bottom of that water box. Where when you, as it, as it starts to condense, the alcohol starts to condense, the hot water will rise just like heat at any, any given thing. Anytime you throw heat, some heat's gonna rise. So we got a slot in that water box with the cold water on the bottom. As it heats up, that hot water rises and runs off the top of that water box. That way you constantly got cold water coming in. As that steam goes down that coil, it reaches two or three coils, it starts to condense. Now when it condenses, we want to make sure that we don't run it too hard. We want to make sure that liquor's good and cool. Because you don't want it too hard, too hard it'll, uh, it'll be a little hot. And uh, once it starts running, it's real high proof. You see a lot of people grab it right out of the right out of the worm and start drinking. You can't do that. That stuff is so high proof. I mean, it leaks the uh, skin off your lips. Believe me. So that's why we use we got a proofing barrel and we got a filter. So as it comes off, we start catching it a bucket at a time. We pour it through that filter. It goes down. Now every bucket we get, it starts to get a little bit lower as far as the alcohol content, lower and lower. So this is a trick. You got to keep mixing the low with the high until you get it to a point where you can sell it. Now, different uh, liquors calls for different, what we call bead, different proof. If you run in regular corn liquor, you can have it say at 90, 95 proof. If you run in brandy, peach brandy, apple brandy, it's gotta be 105, 110 proof. People won't buy it. It's, it's just the way it is. I don't care if, when they take that jar and hit it, if it don't have that big bead on it, you might as well still get it. And as far as hydrometers and, and proofers and all that stuff, we never knew what any of that was. None of it. I never saw proof in my life. We always did it by eye. That's the way we were taught. I tell people that we weren't, we weren't uh, taught how to make liquor. We were told how to do it. And we never changed a thing. And anything we do, we do it exactly the way my father did it, his buddies, my grandfather did it, and we stick straight to that. Why change something that's been tweaked 100 years ago? And that's, that's the way we look at it. I think there's the misconception, the stereotype, the big one is that, you know, it's the hillbilly. It's the hillbilly doing this. And, you know, if a hillbilly is, has a lot of ingenuity, they're hardworking, call me a hillbilly. I, you know, I'm a hillbilly then, it's fine with me. Um, that's, that's the big misconception about people that make moonshine is that they, you know, um, look a certain way and act a certain way. And uh, to me, it's all about carrying on your heritage and being a smart business person and um, honoring your traditions, your family. And, um, you know, it's, it's really gained traction with the distilleries now being legal. And um, I like seeing that people that have done this their whole lives or learned it from their parents or grandparents can now make a legal living doing this. You know, moonshine is a, a big factor in our tourism here in Franklin County, but it's also somewhat it's in its infancy, which is uh, hard to believe. It's uh, been around for a very long time, but here recently uh, we've started to see the families that have opened up the legal distilleries, uh, and it's really opened up a lot of opportunities here in Virginia's Blue Ridge, and especially in Franklin County. Uh, and we're also very excited as we move into the future, uh, as Franklin County, Patrick County, and Floyd County have kind of partnered and, and teamed up uh, and we're creating the Virginia Moonshine Heritage Trail, uh, which will again, will look to draw even more visitors uh, into our local localities. The moonshine industry is bringing in folks uh, from all over the world. And a big reason for that is the authentic nature 
of the moonshine and spirit industry here in Franklin County. From the family, the places, the people, and those unique stories. That authentic nature is, I think, what is drawing people here to Franklin County to experience authentic moonshine. That smells real good. <laughs>